My very first TV memory is the moon landing. Watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin hopping around in spacesuit on a grainy black and white TV deeply influenced who I am today. I became an engineer and read everything science and technology related that I can get my hands on. But somehow the moon landing overpromised. By the expectations of my four-year-old self, we should have cities on Mars and I should have spent my last vacation on the moon. But since these promising beginnings, we have retreated to low Earth orbit and even that became challenging. So in this video I talk about how NASA appeared to share my frustration, was not happy with their suppliers and built their own supplier, SpaceX. Let's get started. To understand NASA's approach to SpaceX, it is necessary to go back to the space shuttle. Like NASA set on five rocket that had put the first man on the moon in 1969, the space shuttle was a triumph of American engineering and business collaboration. Several suppliers had been involved in the construction of the Saturn V. And the same suppliers were again NASA's main partners with the space shuttle. In 1972, the original contract to build the world's first reusable orbiter was worth $2.6 billion. But for all its success, the Space Shuttle program did not fulfill its ambitions. Built to fly 12 missions every year, the average shuttle flew just 28 times in its entire operational life. There were several reasons for this. One was that NASA's budget kept shrinking as new presidents chopped and changed priorities. And this squeezed the amount of money available for NASA's primary objective to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity. To get back on track, NASA created the Commercial Orbital Transportation Program in 2005. The idea was to start what it called the engine of competition and engage with suppliers in a new way so that they could build the affordable spacecraft needed to undertake routine missions to the International Space Station. In the past, as with the Saturn V and the Space Shuttle, NASA had designed the spacecraft, paid suppliers to build the spacecraft on a so-called cost-plus basis and kept ownership of the vehicle. In other words, NASA paid all the costs of designing the spacecraft and all the expenses incurred by the suppliers when building the spacecraft and retained ultimate responsibility for the program. Under the Commercial Orbital Transportation Program and the Associated Commercial Resupply Program, this changed. First, NASA issued general specifications for the spacecraft, leaving suppliers with the challenge of designing vehicles in their own way. Second, it awarded fixed-price contracts, thereby transferring the risk of delays and other problems to the suppliers. Third, it let the suppliers keep the spacecraft and all the associated intellectual property. In 2006, NASA put the contract out to tender. It was looking to award contract to two suppliers that would compete with each other to be the first to demonstrate their space transportation capabilities. In all, NASA received 21 proposals. SpaceX, not yet four years old, was one of the two successful suppliers beating other better known publicly listed and government funded companies. NASA gave SpaceX the goal of developing a rocket powerful enough to take crew and cargo to the International Space Station following the anticipated retirement of the Space Shuttle fleet in 2010. The time frame was challenging. And so too were the commercial terms. Since NASA wanted the suppliers to have skin in the game, SpaceX was required to find matching funding for NASA's investment of nearly $396 million. In the end, SpaceX raised a lot more than that from investors including the governments of Canada, Malaysia, Sweden, as well as the US Air Force. This was no mean feat. The other company originally awarded the contract, Oklahoma-based rocket plane Kistler, failed to raise sufficient matching funding and its contract was re-awarded to Orbital Sciences Corporation and they are now owned by Northrop Grumman. But after the early fundraising success, SpaceX suffered a series of setbacks. 
From 2006 to 2008, it tried and failed to launch its relatively small Falcon 1 rocket three times. Elon Musk was close to admitting defeat. But the fourth launch in September 2008, paid by the last of his money, was a success, making SpaceX the first private company to put a liquid fuel rocket into orbit. It vindicated Musk's commitment to space exploration and it vindicated the dogged determination of NASA's procurement team, who had defied the skeptics questioning the controversial strategy of creating a new type of supplier. A few months later, SpaceX was awarded a new $1.6 billion contract to send 12 cargo missions to the International Space Station over the next eight years. On the face of it, this was an extraordinary vote of confidence in SpaceX, coming so soon after the first successful demo of the Falcon 1 rocket. But it reflected the increasingly close working relationship between NASA and the supplier. It is important to emphasize that NASA did not only invest billions of dollars in SpaceX, it also invested significant time and expertise. The commercial orbital transportation and the commercial resupply services programs authorized an extraordinary transfer of knowledge NASA had accumulated since its creation in the late 1950s. The secrets of many NASA technologies were presented to SpaceX, giving SpaceX an advantage over its rivals. This has been compared to the time when the US Defense Department handed over the internet to the private sector. But NASA's gamble paid off. In 2012, SpaceX, having developed its far more powerful Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon's cargo capsule, became the first private company to dock, or to be precise, berth a spacecraft to the International Space Station. For NASA, the price tag for developing this capability was about $400 million, a fraction of the $4 billion it estimated it would have spent on doing everything the old cost plus way as before. Two years later, NASA gave SpaceX another vote of confidence. After the final space shuttle flight touchdown in 2011, the US had been forced into the humiliating situation of having its astronauts hitch a ride on the Soyuz missions of Russia for the princely sum of $90 million. To remedy this situation, NASA sought proposals from suppliers willing to develop crewed missions to the space station. If American astronauts were going to get an Uber-style lift to space, then at least the taxi service should be American. In the end, NASA's procurement team awarded the contract to two suppliers, SpaceX and Boeing. Boeing's contract was more lucrative $4.2 billion versus SpaceX's $2.6 billion. From then on, Boeing and SpaceX engaged in a friendly but competitive rivalry. And to everyone's surprise, it was the relative newcomer SpaceX that reached the finishing line first. Among the game-changing technologies pioneered by SpaceX and designed to reduce cost radically were the reusable rocket booster and the reusable crew-capable Dragon capsule. NASA specified what it wanted, a vehicle that would take astronauts and cargo to space, but it did not specify how. This gave SpaceX significant room for maneuver and gave Musk the opportunity to ask his brilliant engineering team a simple question. How many people would fly across the Atlantic if, at the end of the journey, the airplane was scrapped? No one the team responded. Exactly, said Musk. And so the team set to work developing a reusable rocket. Now not every company can be compared to NASA and not every startup supplier is led by an Elon Musk and not all of them will become a SpaceX in their respective industry. But the lessons here are relevant for many companies. If you are stuck with a limited number of suppliers and are unhappy with their performance, there is a way out. And creating the supply that you want is doable if you really set your mind to it. By the way, in my SRM framework, we are in the right pillar in which NASA elevated SpaceX from bailout to invest and they may now be at the verge of integrate. Okay, now it is your turn. Are you unhappy with your current supplier portfolio? And do you think that making your own supplier is a worthwhile effort? Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, I promise to get back to you within 24 hours. And if useful, I may even respond with a dedicated video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and I see you in the next one. Bye.